Eleanor Roosevelt had this great quote. She said that poor minds talk about other people, average minds talk about events, but great minds talk about ideas. Welcome to the Take On Everything podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Take On Everything. Tonight, we have a special episode on the trade war and protectionism. As always, I am James Cook and my co-host. Hi, guys. I'm Sarah Brooke. And uh, so tonight, to talk about the trade war and protectionism, we have Dr. William Anderson. I uh, got his PhD from uh, Auburn University. Uh, teaches at Frostburg University. He contributes to the Independent Review, Reason Magazine, Free Market, The Freeman, uh, American Journal on Economics and Sociology, uh, Foundation of Economic Education, the Heartland Indist Institute, Mises.org, LouRockwell.com, and countless others. And he also had a great uh, column uh, blog uh, uh, contradicting uh, Paul Krugman. Um, from 2010 to 2013, which was a wonderful little uh, Contra blog to uh, Krugman, if you knew who that is. So welcome to the show, Dr. Anderson. Hey, welcome. How you doing? How you doing? Fantastic. Glad to have you on. All right, glad to be yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So to start off, um, you'll find out very quickly I'm an idiot. So let's like <laughs> define some terms. <laughs> okay. So what, what is a trade war? You have to... Uh, country one country or even a number of countries trying to block the sale of of imports okay in other words uh, you'll, you'll love this the trade war where you want to sell your goods overseas but you don't want to allow anybody in your country to buy goods from overseas well what happens when a whole bunch of countries start trying to do that you end up with measures that simply just block exchange and so that so one you know that countries you know, stop trading with each other or the amount of trade goes down rapidly this is what we saw uh, from about 1930 until the end of world war ii in fact that the 1930s were very much a decade of of, of trade wars and and uh, all sorts of things of course at the end of the decade led to this little skirmish that we know as World War II. And I'm sure that the trade wars had nothing to do with it. Okay, that makes sense. So like, how do they impose barriers? Well, they uh, generally, there are three ways of doing it. Uh, the, the most obvious is what we call the tariff. The tariff is a tax on imports. And um, there are two types of tariffs. There is a revenue tariff. Uh, which the United States had most of the revenue that the United States government got all the way until the passage of the income tax in 1913 was um, through the tariff. And so there, it was a tax, it was a way to fund the government. Right? But that's a tax that it, it's fairly low. Um, it's The idea is to raise revenue. Then there's the protective tariff which is a high tax, and it is meant to discourage the importation of goods, or at least to make them really expensive. So let's say that, for example, um, uh, the United States decides that, that GM should not have to compete with Toyota. All right, And we're going to assume that Toyota does not have any plants in the United States, which it does. But, but we'll assume that to all Toyotas are made in Japan. And so the government says, we don't want GM to have to compete with Toyotas, because frankly, Toyotas are better cars, and, uh, and super American consumers will recognize that and buy Toyotas instead of GMs. And so what we'll do is put a 25% tax on the Toyotas and thus raise their price, make them more expensive relative to the General Motors cars, and then when that happens, people will substitute out of the Toyota to General Motors. So that's the, that is the second kind of, of tariff, a protective tariff that is meant to discourage imports. The revenue tariff tries to be more neutral. It's, it's actually you know, a way to try to get revenue for the government. 
uh, protective tariff is not so much about getting revenue from the government as it is just blocking imports. Then there's the quota. The quota says, oh, let's, uh, let's go back to the Toyotas again. Let's say that they say only 100,000 Toyotas will be allowed into this country this year. So that is going, so that limits the supply, which also has the effect of driving up the price and making it more expensive relative to, say, domestic cars like General Motors cars. That is the quota. Uh, and uh, they can, the quotas generally are, set with what, well, well, we'll talk about how the stuff's administered. It's, it's very different now than it used to be and uh, really kind of goes up against the edge of what the Constitution allows, but that's for another story. But anyway, uh, quotas are numerical, there, there, there are numerical limits, and then there the other is the things like you you start imposing laws, maybe environmental laws, um, health and safety uh, inspections. I remember that wooden baseball bats that Americans tried to uh, import to Japan. You would have one person at an inspection station inspecting each bat, each wooden bat. All right. Well, the idea is to allow so few of them in that you you know you can't make any kind of meaningful sale. So you have those as well. Um, and with something like health and safety or environmental, there could be a very good reason for that. Um, often it's very hard to differentiate. Sometimes these rules are put in for protectionist purpose purposes. Other times that they may have a protectionist effect, but that was not their purpose, if you know what I mean. So there's all sorts of little nuances here and that I'm trying to, um, to bring about. But those are your three types of, of uh, blocks to imports. I know those, those okay. wooden bats sound pretty dangerous. It sounds like we oh, ought to inspect yeah. every single one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you can't just let those things in. Because that's terrifying. If I have an like, uninspected wooden bat, who knows what's going to happen? My child could get a splinter. And the broken bat. The broke, you know, the boom, like that. All the bat splits. You hit the ball in the trademark. And, and who knows? I don't know, Doctor. You're, Dr. Anderson, you're talking uh, you're talking to me into supporting all of these measures. Because that just sounds like, you know, unregulated, unregulated market forces. That sounds terrifying. No, it, yeah, it's right. The unregulated bat. Yeah, it could I know be, it's uh, uh yeah, it, yeah. every American's worst nightmare. Exactly, but yeah, you know, and so, but those are those are things that that are done. And by the way, there's always here's the thing about something like protectionism. There's always going to be a constituency for them, and um, you know, it's like what you call member and regulation. We talked about Baptists and bootleggers. Sarah, you're gonna like this one, all right? Baptists and bootleggers, both of them. Want the liquor stores closed. Now, I lived in the county for four years, McMinn County, Tennessee, and it was a dry county. And we had a bootlegger named Clemmer Coleman. And people would write, you know, write letters to the editor, you know, why are they going to shut down Clemmer Coleman? Well, of course, the deputies liked Clemmer Coleman because he, had, he enabled them to be able to buy their pickup trucks and make other payments for this and that. Um, and Clemmer, you know, Clemmer being the upstanding citizen he was, did not like the idea of McMinn County ever being anything but a dry county. And, uh, of course, the Baptists also wanted McMinn County, and the Methodists, especially the Shouting Methodists, and they wanted McMinn County to be a, um, a dry county, too. And so how do you get, okay, so you have one group that has sort of an economic interest, and another group that will have more of an ideological interest in, you know, in, in uh, you kind of get them together. And you get some really, really interesting coalitions, trust me. We talked about that during class. I talked about some of the interesting coalitions that we had. And I think that pertains to the drug war, too. You have the drug cartels, and this is a whole other topic, but you have the drug cartels. They want drugs illegal because they make a ton of money. No, and then you also have... Yeah, absolutely. And then you have the people here. It's like, oh, drugs are bad for you. So you have this weird coalition oh, yeah. of oh, yeah. unlikely well, friends. Yeah, I mean that's just it. You know, Chapo and and uh, and 
you know, of course, Joe Biden was a big drug warrior, you know, so that little, little did he know he was contributing to his, to his wealth. I mean, because the other thing is, my God, you hate to see a whole thing go corporate, right? You know, and it just, I mean, there's some romanticism in as violent as they are in these drug dealers, whereas once they go cor- corporate, I mean, where's the romance? And on where, where's the secret? hide out up in the mountains someplace. You don't have that anymore. Instead, you just got corporate headquarters somewhere. Yeah, it's no fun. No, you know, no, if you're going to be a cartel, no. you got to be out in the bush somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get let's get off the drug. By the way, that is our next episode. Sarah Brooke and I are working on a drug war episode next. So that's actually a decent segue. We'll, I'll, I'll edit that at the end of the show. Exactly. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Always be plugging. Always be plugging. Uh-huh. That always plug it. Every single. <laughs> so the reason I think the reason that I I wanted to like start that we wanted to do this episode is because you always get a little concerned once you have certain players that are pushing things like protectionism. So for example, you have Bernie Sanders, mm-hmm. you've got Donald Trump, you've got Elizabeth Warren, Tucker Carlson, uh, and Pat Buchanan. All these people. Are, are from the far right and the far left, they all want the same thing. And that makes me nervous. Yeah, it so. does. <laughs> it's true. So that's why, I, that's right. That's why we got to talk about it. So some of, some of the things you said earlier, kind of, it's it sounds like it makes sense. Like, you know, there, there are certain things that, you know, could potentially be good. You know, you want to keep some dangerous products off the market. But like, you know, so I've heard people say that tariffs are just like the cost of doing business. Like, you know, if, if you want to have protectionist tariffs in order to, like, keep industries like American industries alive, um, if you don't protect American industries, um, aren't American jobs going to go overseas? Well, here's an interesting point. That's yeah, because that is the standard argument. They'll talk about well, so many jobs are shipped overseas. Well, first, I kind of like uh, Walter Williams uh, example. He says, you know, he says, I don't see any shipping containers with jobs in them. Uh, you know, that, that uh, a job is not a product, it is not a good, um, the assu- there, that is an assumption, all right? But there is something else to be said for that, and that is that um, we can, you know, we can, true, we could have a larger portion of our workforce that is in, you know, and we, we can block imports of, say, textiles. All right. And then, therefore, we could have a larger American workforce doing textiles like it was back when when I was in high school, college, even my post-college days. Uh, we still had a pretty large textile industry. It's much smaller now. A lot of firms, that, uh, textile firms have gone out. But we could do that theoretically. We could block all, you know, all clothing, cloth imports and make everything domestically. But that means we're going to have to divert resources elsewhere from the tech, you know, not, you know, it's not like you would just be adding that with not giving up anything. Plus the fact, right, here's a little something, because um, I remember in about 1985, I um, purchased, would purchase some very nice pinpoint cotton shirts for about $30. Right? That's in 1985, 35 years ago. If you go to say, um, what was it, uh, Costco, you can get a very, very nice pinpoint cotton shirt for under thirty dollars. All right, and that is in two thousand and twenty dollars. In fact, textile products, textile prices have fallen drastically. They are much, you know, that clothing. That I mean, I'm I'm serious that when I say this. That it's a lot of clothing now nominally is as cheap or cheaper than it was 35 years ago. Now, if we had only a domestic textile industry, I can assure you that that pinpoint cotton shirt would be well over a hundred dollars. And, um, I'm not paying that. Yeah. <laughs> I am not paying. You are not, no, I'm not, I'm not either. I did not pay. I got this in Costco right here and I got this sweater cheap from Joe Bank. All right, I say cheap. Probably. I can't say I have a Michael Kors shirt on that I paid fifty dollars for, so I can't even. Yeah, yeah, it would have cost you one hundred and fifty. There, I mean that that, and and this is this is something a little more difficult to explain. All right, it's something that I tried to do, but that 
we have a tendency to think that resources swap out one to one. All right. So if we divert resources to say, okay, instead of concentrating more on, on the, let's say, high tech or some of the other things that, that we do, that we're instead going to um, we're going to con- we're going to go back and try to have the U.S. economy where it was, say, 35, 40, 45 years ago in terms of manufacturing and the like. And if we were to do that, given all of the other structures we have, what you would have would be you know, automobiles that cost you know, come out a, a typical car that you might pay $20,000 for, having to pay 50000 for it or something like that. That the cost, that, that, that the cost would be exponentially or at least, let's just say, geometrically higher. Right, so it's not simply just that it's not simply just a one-to-one swap. All right, we have you know that Patrick. That's one of the errors that Patrick Buchanan makes. He makes a lot of them, but uh, one of them that he makes is the idea that if we block there, block imports coming in, then we can make these things here. Americans will have jobs, uh, and nothing else will change. All other prices will remain this what they are now, and uh, that our standard of living will be just as high as it is then. All right. Here's the problem: when you block trade, when you get in the way, you create what we call deadweight losses. You in a deadweight loss. I'm, you know, you'll, I mean, show it graphically when I'm teaching. But deadweight loss simply is a loss of possible exchange and production. It simply does not take place. And it's so it's it's like, for example, uh, a storm comes in and knocks down your house. Okay, that house is no longer there. <laughs> All right, there is nothing that you get for it. I mean, the storm has not, unless the house needed to be knocked down. I mean, but. Uh, and you were planning on knocking it down. Anyway, let's assume there was a really nice house that you're living in, uh, and it gets taken out by the storm. That it's that there is a loss there. There is a real loss of wealth that now we're going to have to take from future, you know, future direction of resources. We have to redirect them back to that house to build what already was there. Now the house to build back might be nicer than the previous one. But nonetheless, there are deadweight losses. And this is one of the things that happens when we block trade. We have these deadweight losses. We have opportunity that disappear forever. And what it really means is that the standard of living of people goes down a little bit. All right. Some people, now, by the way, it's not this nice little even. Everybody has a little bit of a decline in standard of living. No, it's going to hit some people pretty hard and other people not as hard. And, but, uh, yeah. I'm an idiot. But let me make sure of this. Um, um, yes. Yes. It does give jobs to foreign countries. But what it really does for here is it shifts the focus to different industries that are better utilized with our resources. So no, we're not making t-shirts and iPhones, but who the hell wants to? Because we're here designing t-shirts and iPhones. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a lot, yeah, and which generally is a better job than making uh, it's it really is something else to keep in mind too. All right, and this is very this is fundamental. But one of the things that we really lose out, or we we have discussions on economics, and that is that the end of all production is consumption. We do not produce for its own sake. We do not produce for the sake of producing. We produce in order to consume. In other words, it's a purposeful activity. One of the problems that happens when we, um, when we, in all these debates, and especially once you start bringing the Keynesian perspectives in and the like, is that you end up with the economy as a perpetual motion machine 
that the purpose of it is to keep people employed. Well, okay, why do we keep them employed? Well, they can put goods on the shelves. Okay, why do we buy the goods? Well, we've got to get the goods off the shelves so we can make more of them so we can get keep people employed. And so you end up with this image of a perpetual motion machine when, in fact, it's a linear process. And that is that we produce in order to consume. It would be nice if we could consume without having to produce, that everything that we needed was already there and that we didn't have to work for it, we didn't have to pay for it, it was just there. That would be called a cornucopia. That would be very nice. Well, what about like, well, what about like, because we're in this, because we're in this of, of production. And like, as we move towards automation, like we don't need people in those spots anyway. So like, what does it matter if they went to China when they're going to be replaced by a robot? Mm -hmm. Well, and also here's the thing. And this, this again, is something that's difficult. It's easy to talk about. It's difficult for people to swallow. Okay. And that is that we make the assumption first regarding labor. Labor is a scarce good. that. There's always another thing for labor to do. There are tasks, there are things that are left undone. And there are always, there's always more to do. And so when we replace a bunch of workers with robots, there are two things that happen. One, that the finished product probably is even better than it would have been had you had the people who are having to do all this work themselves. But now that frees up labor to be a Applied in places where it could not be applied before, and that's where people. That's where somebody like Tucker Carlson. He wouldn't like my saying that. At all. Oh, he he got really he got really mad when uh, Elon Musk made those um, those self driving trucks. He just had he had an entire episode where he was just like losing it. He's like, "This is going to cause so much unemployment. This is going to destroy the economy. What are truckers going to do?" He like lost his mind. I was watching the episode. I was like, "I don't know if he's going to control Tucker, himself." Still, yeah. Tucker, still yeah. Him, right? yeah, Tucker's look. Be honest, Tucker's a good guy. I've actually been in his house, met his family, and and uh, he's kind of. And Tucker's gone more from the liberty. He was more libertarian back when you know when I met him was, was over there, but. But, um, yeah, they don't understand. Here's the thing. It's ultimately, what are, we, what are we doing? We are producing goods for consumption to meet our own our needs, okay, to make ourselves better off. That there is nothing wrong with the production of goods. Uh, and, I mean, I know all of the arguments, believe me, of, you know, that, you know, you your life is just consistent with money and all that. I understand that. That's not my point. But what I'm saying is that the reason that we produce is to make things that are useful for other people, that people need, our people are willing to purchase. And, and when we get, we get so far away from that because we get the thinking that the person is a worker, all right, well, like in the Soviet Union, I mean, think about it. Even now, I mean, the New York Times, my God, they pre presented the Bolshevik Revolution back in 2017, you know, that series there, as Paradise Lost. Okay, why? Because people have this mentality. Well, it revolved around the work and that the workplace was the place for political organizing. Well, that's true, uh, but however... Everything that they made in that country in terms of goods just sucked. It was awful. You know, I mean, I remember God being in East Germany in 1982. It's like, no, I don't want to eat your food. I bought something to drink. I asked for a Coke, and he gave me a bottle with a brown wrapper on it, and it was awful. It's, yeah, it was like drinking cherry cough syrup. I asked for a Coke. They gave me something like some cherry cough syrup or something. Get this and, man a Coke, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> how, how soon after that did you but, get a Coke, though? Like, did you go? Did you go straight to the nearest place? No, no, we stopped off someplace. And, and, and I was the food. I, I'm not eating that. You know, God, I'm not eating that. But the um, uh, and I paid a lot of money for it too. It wasn't cheap. But the uh, but 
you know, the cars, they, they had these crappy Lottas and, and Wartburgs and Trabants running around. I mean, it sounded like a lawnmower rally. But, uh, um, um, he's not pulling any punches with the communists yeah, over there. Yeah. He's like, you guys can't do coke, right? You guys can't make cars, right? You guys can't make food, I mean, right? You know, the, the only reason the Skoda was halfway diesel was because it was a private car company for years before the Czech government took over. And then it went back private again. They started making good cars. But here's the thing. The important thing is that all production is for consumption. And when we say, oh, no, it is about the worker. Now, it's one of the, you know, Bernie Sanders might like you to you know, hear that. But in economics, there are perspective. And this goes all the way back to the classical say uh, Adam Smith and, uh, for that matter, Jean-Baptiste Say in the continent and all the way up through Mises, Marshall, and all that. It was ultimately the end of production is consumption. And so... That and if you think about it, what are companies doing? They're constantly improving their products. They're constantly um, innovating. Stuff is, you know, I remember growing up, and and every year, that, you know, that there was always something new with the automobiles. Every model, every year, had a little bit of an improvement over the, you know, the previous. Or you hope, anyway. I mean, some cars. I mean, they might got you know, like the Edsel was just so butt ugly that you know you couldn't improve on it because. You know, it, it was just awful. But uh, but guess what? Consumers rejected it. Yeah, they, they rejected the card. So uh, that's the you know, thing you, you're producing for consumers who are making a free choice, right? And the typical consumer, by the way, really doesn't care if this computer that I'm looking at, this camera and everything else is made in China or made in the United States. What they want is a computer that works. Um, and you know, I'm wearing, uh, by the way, I am, so uh, you don't see it. I'm wearing a pair of, uh, East German work pants. These, this was, this was East German army surplus. When they, 30 years ago, when they had a going out of business sale, you know, I got, I got a bunch of stuff, man, out of it, out of the, out of it. It was great. God bless the going out of business sales. <laughs> yeah. Man, I got yeah, I got I got a I got an 1895 Russian M91 you know rifle like one of those things from Doc and Chivago. Great. Okay, so I have a question. Okay, so I have a so if the market so will provide it and consumer will pick the best product, wouldn't we want our citizens to have the best car, even if that car wasn't made in America? And then we could just focus on producing something that no other country can make better than us. That, that's generally what happens. Yeah, and or, or, you know, there's, yeah, you could do that. Now, here's the thing. Often domestic policy gets in the way of that. And that's where we get into problems because that it's like we don't want you to buy from China. That's bad. But we're going to make sure you can't make anything decent either. Uh, it's like you know, the mentality out here in California with, you know, with the legislature. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, they because they're so ideological in, in their approach that you know, they, they forget that, you know, maybe it would be good to actually have for people to be able to make something halfway decent. Uh, but I, I, I know what you're saying. And, and what we call it in trade, we call it comparative advantage. Um, and, and and what happens Wait, there? What do these terms mean? Okay, comparative advantage is nothing more than than what you were talking about. It, it's putting into econ, econ term what you just described. What do we do? In other words, what do we do better that we put fewer resources in than somebody else has to do has to put in? And it's about who you know you produce at the lowest opportunity cost. All trade, all exchange is based upon what we call comparative advantage, and that is having a, uh, a lower opportunity cost in in making something. That, uh, uh, and, 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 and by the way, goes whether it's in the United States, whether it's a good that is, is produced here. I'll, I'll give you an example. It's, um, I, I use it in my, in my homework for coffee. 
uh, that it's easier to grow coffee in Latin America. The climate and, and everything is, is more suited for it than it is here. We actually grow coffee on the mainland in Santa Barbara. If somebody grows California coffee, but it's like about fifteen twenty dollars a pound, and you know it's it's not like it's this incredibly tasty coffee that you can only get here. It's just kind of a you know oh wow that's kind of cool, <laughs> but uh, yeah, compa- but it would be comparative advantage. Okay, then what's the difference between comparative advantage and absolute advantage? Absolute advantage is where you would be able to make one or the other uh, uh, or a combination of the two. Uh, you, you, can make, you could make more than they could elsewhere. We will do this with, with trade between. It's, it would seem the United States has the ability to make one or the other. And we could, you know, if we take two products and you could, our combined resources, we'd be able to make more than they would. But even there, there is always, always a lower opportunity cost. That, in other words, that it makes, here, this goes back to David Ricardo in 1815. And Ricardo pointed out that there is no reason not to trade because somebody will always have some kind of comparative advantage. They will have a lower opportunity cost for something. It's just a question of finding it and then being willing to purchase that you know, those goods. Yeah, like one of my favorite examples of comparative versus absolute advantage was, um, I forget who said it, but it was like one person is a lawyer and she's really good at both the law and she's really good at typing. She's the best. Her assistant doesn't have a law degree and isn't as good a typer as her, right? But what the opportunity cost of the lawyer is, like say the lawyer types everything, well, then she can do less law. What if she does all the law? Well, then she's going to do less typing. So in this scenario, it's better for the lawyer to be a lawyer and the assistant to do the typing, even though the lawyer is better at both. Because the the value of the law practice is better than typing. That's... And so just apply that to like a country. It's like exactly what the coffee thing is like. We could make coffee, uh, you know, and we could, um, you know, Latin America could make coffee and they make cheaper cars like like Mexico makes mm-hmm. cheaper cars than the U.S. Um, but it's, you know, the, the resources they would need to do that. The opportunity cost is the other one. You would be less yeah. of the other thing. And so therefore, runner up. You know, just get somebody off the bench to make that stuff because we can't. We, I'm not yeah, going to work 20 and, hours a day. In fact, I, I like that example. We, we do this, you know, a lot. Any type, often you'll see this in, in uh, for example, I, I do kind of handyman stuff around here, but uh, behind me, we need to put in a another hot water. Heater. I am tired of this one hot water. Heater. And so I theoretically could learn how to do it. I can watch lots of YouTubes to do it and whatnot, uh, but we certainly wouldn't save any money. I might electrocute myself in the process. But... <laughs> and with the cost of medical care these days, you just can't afford to do it. Even even if we had to um, you know, hire somebody, it would be that they would have a real comparative advantage because I still can do other things to make money. In fact, I really need to be doing that. Um, now, I do every once in a while, I'll, I'll do something like I build a game out here. I never built one before. So I, you bet I looked at YouTube and all that. I told my wife I was going to build a game. For but that was a little bit different, you know. But, but the, uh, all of it's crazy out here, by the way. You know, we're, we're building a fence for her, uh, my brother in law and I were building a <laughs> Or my wife wouldn't fence, and people come by. Do you guys got a card? Hey, do you do? You know, we need a fence at our place. You got your card? <laughs> there. Not working. Not the fence. But um, I guess you're a contractor I now. You got to help anybody contracts me. But you know, I, I think that that what happens though is indeed that there is everybody has an opportunity cost to do it. It's called specialization. Our economy is very much based upon two things. It's capital accumulation and specialization. 
that we do, in fact, specialize. And as a result, we have a substantially higher standard of living. Um, you know, we have nice, much nicer houses than we would ever have if we tried to all build them ourselves and um, and the like. And, and so, you know, like, you know, the, the show that I like to watch is Main Cabin Master. OK, and I watch those guys and uh, they, they come to uh, they'll come to a, a place and and you've got the cabin owners. And they're like, guys, uh, please help. And so they'll come in there, and for a pretty good price, they'll fix that thing up, and they'll do all sorts of work because they know what they're doing. They can look at something and say, whereas the cabin owners would have a really hard time figuring that out. They would have to learn everything from scratch. And then the other thing is that these uh, these carpenters, they, they've been doing it for a good part of their lives, and so they just know this stuff is second nature. And so that's where you get the specialization that comes in. And uh, the capitals are power tools. Uh, you know, you see them with their DeWalt, man. <laughs> and and um, so I, I think that, that, that you start doing that. Well, here's the deal. That trade overseas is no different. I mean, what, why is he, what, one thing about the United States, what is the United States? It's a very large free trade zone. The Constitution does not permit states to erect tariffs against each other. That was one of the things when they, uh, they, they got away from the, the Articles of Confederation because states were in, enacting tariffs against each other. And they turned the United States into a very large free trade zone. So that's what the United States is. It's a Economically speaking, it's a free trade zone. Are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me that if, if Maryland had had protectionist tariffs against Colorado, that Maryland would not be Maryland, richer? Well, God help Maryland. No, because like, where would you get your weed from? That's well, true. When, that is. <laughs> if you start, th- you know, thinking that, or or let's just say, hey, why why not Cumberland? Hey, we can make Cumberland. Cumberland will not trade it, and everything that's that's consumed in Cumberland has to be made. Scratch in Cumberland. What kind of standard of living do you think that would have? It'd be a very low standard of living? It'd be exactly. like pioneer days. Because like the countries that make that stuff have a low standard of living. So if we have to move it over here, like we would just follow suit. Yeah, here's, here's an interesting point, though. Okay, countries that one of the things that happened in the last 40 years was that they dropped tariff barriers around the world. Okay, that but they are the tariff barriers. There was are much lower than they were at the end of World War II, and one of the one of the results has been a drop in what we call absolute poverty around the world. The world is not as poor as it was when I was in college. You know, when I was twenty two years old, there was a heck of a lot of of absolute down dirt poverty. And the and the these organizations and people putting out the word Paul Ehrlich in uh, the Population Bomb that he published in 1968 declared that we're going to have mass starvation and that there's nothing we could do about it. England might not even be a country by the year 2000 because it'd be such a population die-off. Well, it didn't happen, and in fact, none of the stuff they predicted would happen happened. Instead that countries a place like Vietnam that of course, you know, thank goodness I didn't have to go there and fight on a low draft number, uh, went in for induction, but they signed the peace accords a month and a half after I went in you know, had my physical, so I didn't get, get called up or anything. They ended the draft, it was great. You're like, you didn't have bone stirrups? That close. Vietnam was LBJ's war, and then Nixon territory made it his war. That's another story. But here's the thing. Vietnam was, the idea of, of getting anything, buying anything from Vietnam would have been unthinkable. China, oh my God. I mean, China back in, you know, when I was in college was a total and absolute backwater. That, you know, it, number one, it was closed off. It was, uh, you know, communists, their 
cultural revolution going on. Uh, they had had mass starvation and boys leap forward. This is a place you don't want to buy anything from there unless there's some knickknack or something that say, hey, I, you know, I got this little fan that I, and it was made in China to just prove I've been there. <laughs> like a little shot yeah, glass like you have at the it. airport, right? <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> That's all they, they were good for. Exactly. And they didn't export anything. Uh, and what happened? All right. It's definitely not that you know, case anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'll be honest, when I, I taught for six weeks there in 2019, and there were some poor people there, but generally speaking, there was, I didn't see what I would call poverty. I mean, they're not as wealthy as we are, clearly, but uh, um, they were, it was not a country with a bunch of, you know, raggedly dressed, you know, hungry people. They were doing just fine. And uh, the only thing, they, they're crazy on the motorcycle. Especially with electric ones. <laughs> it's all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, my wife and I, we would look off the street and we'd look in both ways. And uh, like one time, we, we, we loaded up on a hill. There was this woman coming down on a motor scooter. And she had a kid on her lap and she'd drive the thing texting while she's doing it. And I was like, oh my God, this place is crazy. But the truth is that it was, you know, I mean, it was a, it was an okay place to live. All right, it was not that way when I was in college. It would have been 90, over 90% of people lived, they were poor. When I mean poor, they lived in really awful conditions, the kind of conditions that nobody would want to live in today. And that was a lot of 90% of the people. Um, and, you know, they've liberalized their economy. Uh, now, I know they've, they've had some crackdowns, you know, and it's not, there was some bad stuff going on there. But what you know, what I'm saying is that you can see, though, the fruit of 30 years of liberalization because it's, you know, it's not a bad place. We can live there. Yeah, and I was quite comfortable. Some of us could live there. Um, <laughs> some of us could live there. I'm spoiled rotten. I spent $50 on a shirt. Yeah. I couldn't live there. <laughs> well, I, they do. Do. <laughs> I get my groceries <laughs> delivered. Like, I couldn't do it. <laughs> okay, so... Who are we in a trade war with? Is it everybody or is it just like... China, I think there there has been that the retaliation and uh, that uh, China... Okay, let me give you an example. In, in, uh, Trump had an interview with Jason Whitlock about a week before the election. And he told Whitlock that the Chinese are finally paying some of our taxes. We, we're getting money out of the Chinese. We didn't get that before. And you know, somebody points out, no, 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 it's not the Chinese are paying, it's the Americans are paying. They're the ones being taxed. They're paying the taxes for, you know, on the, the tariffs because the tariff is a tax. And so the Chinese don't pay our taxes. We pay our taxes. Are you trying to tell me Mexico uh, didn't pay yeah. for that wall? I remember, I remember that. I, I remember when you were in the campaign, I'd hear that. Thing. Wow, this are people believe in this, or are they just clap because they, just, you know, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, I think, I mean, I look, I mean, I, to build, think about, you talk about issue of trade, think about what that would, would do. You would, you have to, in order to build a new wall, you would have, it would be a huge construction project, much of it taking place in really desolate country where there's no roads there. And so it would make a huge, diversion of resources to do what? To keep goods from coming across the border. Uh, and so therefore, it would be something that we could do to lower our standard of living. And um, and here's another point, I think, because here is one of the arguments that we, that we have, okay? Especially um, years ago, uh, there was a, an economist in Mexico and he made the statement in the speech, he said, Either we import capital or we export people. And Mexico was very much into autarky, that is, you know, self sufficiency. And it was, you know, they had leftist government. And the last thing they wanted to do was import capital. That would be, you know, from the Colossus of the North, better known as the United States. 
And that, you know, so the Mexicans had to say, we've got to preserve our independence by blocking capital imports. So what happened? Oh, and people were very poor. They came to the United States. Now, here is something I think is important to keep in mind, though. And there is the notion, there, there is some truth to it, but the idea that if, you know, they say, well, they're going to cut our, cuts our wages. That makes us poor. And that's one of the things that, you know, we want to have high wages and, and that's why we have protectionism because we want to keep our wage structure up. But remember this, the end of production is consumption. We consume, we produce in order to consume. When we block this kind of production, when we block the importation of things, we're ultimately blocking consumption. We're making it more difficult, more expensive to consume. And that's why uh, I think that there is an effect that, that people don't understand. Uh, a lot of times, you know, to be honest, immigrant labor is not replacing Americans. Um, you know, it's like... You know, Georgia, they, they got, they really cracked down. They, they decided they're going to crack down on, on immigrants, you know, illegal immigrants. And then they start noticing their tomato crops not getting picked like it used to. You know, you got crops rotting in the field. And they figure, oh, yeah, you know, you know Americans, will, you know, good old boys will go out there and pick tomatoes. Well, good old boys want picking tomatoes. And, uh, but all boys were picking tomatoes. They weren't picking tomatoes. Uh, uh, you know, farmers, farmers out here in California, they were had that problem. I mean, that's and that's a disruption as, as well. And um, and so when people tend to look at stuff like imports, okay, they say, well, we import, therefore it's driving prices down. Uh, the American conservative likes to refer to cheap foreign goods as a narcotic. You know, the, the truth is, though, that, that what happens, we are, the, the overall thing, when you start blocking these things coming in, when you start forcing the diversion of resources from lower value use, from higher value uses to lower value uses, you lower the standard of living. And that is, it's almost it's not like a mystery. Because, uh, but the truth is that when you block, you know, that when you block imports, you will have a lower standard of living. Now, it got really serious in the 1930s because you had trade barriers going up. And what did we have to accompany the 30s? Oh, the Great Depression. Oh, they didn't help the Great Depression? Yeah, that was 1930. Congress passed the Smoot Hawley tariff. And you can just, you can see. Yeah, things going downhill from there. And um, it it really, you know, they, they I mean, and, but the thing about the New Deal was not only did you try to block imports, but hey, you tried to block, you know, production and exchange of goods in the United States. Uh, and there should, should be a reason why we call it the Great Depression. You know, the New Deal did not end the Great Depression. It made it worse. It, it the New Deal is why we had the Great Depression. And, you know, think about What? I said leave it. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's already what we do in the United States. And uh, we pretty much have those open markets there. Um, and we've done pretty well with it. You know, it's, and there's no such thing as a trade utopia simply because things are always messy. And that, uh, you know, the, the, you, might, you might have some kind of dispute with another country. You know, it's just, but I'll be honest with you. You know, I lived through the Vietnam War. Um, my brother-in-law was embedded in there. He didn't want to talk about it so often. I mean, he was, you know, he said he lived, I had to live like an animal for a year. And I'd much rather be buying goods from Vietnam and trading with them than, than dropping napalm on them and killing them. 
I, I yeah, like that option, by I the way. Could, <laughs> that option sounds yeah. pretty good. It's I like mean, when you put it that way. Could, yeah, I got, I mean, several years ago, I, I got interviewed by the largest paper in, in, in Vietnam. And I was telling them, you know, guys, this, I, I really prefer this because, uh, you know, back in my college days, they wanted to draft me in so I could go shoot some of them. And I didn't really want to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to buy something from Vietnam. And then, valid. <laughs> valid. You know, yeah. I fully support the decision. <laughs> That's valid. I, yeah, so you should take it. Obama's Nobel Prize and just give it to you because you get it. And he didn't drone strike yeah, kids in the Middle East, too. Anybody, so, though. I mean, that alone. Goods, and that is peace, you know? But if you could kind of narrow some, some ideas down, that is that production is consumption. And I know that's a bad word often because, you know, the conservatives want to see it with, you know, character and family life, a cheap, you know, cheap goods as a narcotic, etc. And on the left, they want the worker. And, you know, they want, they want to, they see their workplace as a place for political organizing. And, um, but if, in fact, production, the purpose of production is to make goods for consumption, the, the point is that when you block these things, you make people poor. Somebody is going to have a lower standard of living. Now, the high standard of it, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I would really prefer a higher standard of living to a lower standard of living. I've done both. Understandable. Understandable. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. That's just. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I was poor, Here's the thing. When I was born in 1953, roughly a third of Americans lived in poverty. And I mean, real life poverty. I remember moving to the Chattanooga area in 1964 from Pennsylvania and going out and seeing just the rural, the poverty that people lived in. I'd never seen shacks like this before. People living in shacks, people living uh, without running water. I mean, and black and white. It was a, it was very depressing, and um, you don't see those things anymore. And I happen to think maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> so, it, it, from what I understand, the, like the trade wars and the protectionism stuff, doesn't that like disproportionately hurt poor people here rather than people that can afford to like pay the price? Yeah. Now, what they'll come back with the protectionists will come back with you that they're saving the industry, the lower wage industries. All right, which uh, should, but here's the thing that let's say they could even be successful with that, that what those people would be paid at those lower wages versus what it would cost for them to cost of living. Uh, they would be worse off than if you allowed those goods to come in and let them find work in other areas. Uh, I know that sounds, you know, a lot of it sounds crazy. Uh, I mean, what we're, you know, we have, you know, look, Number one, the middle class in America is not disappearing. The reason that we have, I mean, even they talk about the growing gap between the 1% and everybody else, a lot of that is involved the things like asset prices, stock prices. Bill Gates is wealthy because he owns, you know, most of his wealth is in Microsoft stock, right? He can't eat it, you know, he, you know that he can't sell too much of it. He's got to hold on to most of it. Do you use that billions of dollars laying around? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's it's got, it's got shares of stock laying around, you know, using toilet paper. I don't know. He's got like that room, oh, like, what is it, Daffy Duck right. in that commercial? He's got, or that cartoon. He's got that oh, room. Yeah. He's like swimming. Yeah, that, so I'm, and I, I think that, that it, it's, it's what it is, as you sit back and you realize there's some things that have happened in the last 40 years. One is that we've become more liberal, liberalized on trade, uh, that we have a ha we've got a lot more capital being exported to you know, or in, you know, built in countries that at one time were just rural, total rural backwaters. And um, we've seen the standard of living in these same countries go up. And at the same time, American standard of living, folks, is not lower than it was in 1980. That is just, yeah, there is a bigger gap 
in income between the very wealthy and others, but what it's done, yeah, their income, you know, or the, the value of it, part of it's going to we're inflating the dollar. And so some like asset prices like stock prices go way up. That's true. But everybody, pretty much, their standard of living has gone up. Um, I would invite you to have the same kind of medical care today. Or, if, you know, go back to the 1980 methods. I don't think you would like that. I think you would say, oh, I go into a grocery store in 1980. Uh, I can assure you that you would not recognize it. It would look like a very basic kind of grocery store. By the way, in 1980, we thought this was the most modern thing in the world. If we were transported back to that, you know, to 40 years ago, we'd say, man, this was a really basic kind of place. Hey, where's, you know, all the specialty foods you saw, you know, where's the, where's the sun-dried tomatoes? You got to do that. I remember, okay, I'll give you an example. In the early 80s, I wanted to get some sun-dried tomatoes. I had to go to a specialty store to get them. You know, it was like, now you get them at a grocery store. But back then, I had to go to a, you know, make a special trip to get sun-dried tomatoes. And they weren't cheap. <laughs> and I'm sure you couldn't Google it yeah. either. So, okay, so you, so from what I'm, what I'm hearing, in general, free trade, international trade, makes both countries a little bit more wealthy. Like the people in rich countries, they don't have to do the stuff the poor people, you know, used to do. And then the poor people in the third world countries that are making like our t-shirts and stuff, they're having better jobs. So everybody's happier. Everybody's doing better. And like we can focus on making computers and technology and software and like doing a lot of these other things that they can't do. So everybody's doing better. So, okay, what about this argument though? So if, if we accept all that's true, then China specifically, you said China's doing a lot better. What if we don't want China to do better? What if we're scared of China? What if we're scared China's going to like attack us or take us over? Don't we want to not make them better? Well, that's, yeah, that's kind of like, uh, uh, I used to, uh, we used to refer to that as Auburn optimality when I was in grad school, where you, where you make somebody else, you make somebody else worse off, you make yourself worse off in the process, but you hope you make the other person even worse off just to screw them. And, uh, but, but that's I, I yeah I've heard that you know it, it's kind of like a national defense thing. Oh my gosh, China is going to to become rich, and then they're going to attack other countries, and then they're going to be like us. But of course, we like to believe that we're the peace loving people, and we don't attack you unless you really need attacking. You know, but my point is the best way to avoid war with China is to have a really good trading relationship with them. That countries that have strong trading relationships between them tend not to go to war with one another. Um, you know, we've never gone to war with Canada. Uh, the movie Canadian Bacon, um, you know, notwithstanding, uh, the last war we had in Mexico was in 1848, and we started that one. Um, that's which is one reason I'm not a conservative. You know, I'm just not. I can't you know, I, because I can't go with this America needs to fight wars. I, I'll give the American conservative that kind of thing. But the point, you know, Frederick Boscow once said that if good soul cross borders, armies will. Well, that, you know, I know it's sim kind of a little bit simplistic, but the truth is that trade promotes peace a whole lot better than backstabbing and, and shooting and, and other things like that. Um, I, and I think that that we, we, we forget that we or we tend to put trade in war term. You know, like I remember uh, I used to have this on a, as a what, this is one of the questions I would ask my grad students. And that would be that uh, during the 1980s, a U.S. Senator uh, or, or 90, during the 1990s, a U.S. Senator made the comment that, well, we won the Cold War, now we have to win the trade war. I said, okay, compare these two statements. And you don't win a trade war. How do you how do you win a trade war? I don't know how you would win that, because what is the definition of winning? You wouldn't be able to define it. Yeah, lower your standard of living. You know, hey, you want you know, you think it's terrible if the very rich go and ski like go bomb bail. You know? Uh Set, set a fleet of B-52s over there, you know, and, and 
wipe out the whole ski area. That you know. <laughs> yeah, we can. You want to see poor? We can yeah, do poor. Right. We'll do poor better than everybody. We're yeah, gonna be the greatest yeah. poor nation yeah, in the and, world. And I, you will I, never I, see I, anything I, poorer. I mean, I, I want these folks, and I, I really like. You know, I, I don't think commercial stuff is bad. I like being in. I like being around stores with good gentlemen and, and shops, and you know, and and restaurants and things like that. I I kind of happen to like that. I like cooperation. <laughs> And um, I, I think that we, you know, we, 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 the United States, for all of the production, all of the good stuff that we've done, we also happen to think of ourselves as this warrior nation or something. And um, I, I think that we, we really get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And, and, and it, you know, it's something like the Iraq War. The Iraq War, I don't look, the thing that made me angriest about the real walk the rock war was not even Americans getting killed and coming back. It's that we made war on people who were not at war with us. And we you know, we killed God knows how many of them destroyed their lives, created the refugee problems. And for what? Uh, uh, I'd rather be buying oil from I'd rather be trading with them. And by the way, by the way, even you, you talk about the this notion of how how they view trade the United States was planning on financing the Iraq war by seizing the oil. The, uh, the Iraqis would, the idea, I'm serious, the idea was that they would pay for the invasion with their oil. That sounds familiar. Is that what Trump got <laughs> the idea? Like, wait a minute. Pay for the wall. <laughs> I, do this again? I remember hearing that and I was like, wait a second, that's what the Soviets did in Afghanistan. They stole their natural gas and their your cement. They had real high quality cement. One thing they made in Afghanistan, really good cement. And the Soviets stole it. Uh, but uh, it, it, I think that, that that's a larger picture as well, that trade economic relationships are not bad relationships. Uh, you know, the Pope notwithstanding, I, I believe me, I prefer them to to alliances you know, and shooting and, and the like. As I said before, it's just, I, I am really, I was really glad to be able to teach in China and not have to um, worry about like what I was like my high school and college years. We were scared of them. Hey, you know, this commie, they're, bunch, they're, they're, they're you know, granted, you know, we'd, we'd actually kind of been at war with them in Korea. You know, and, and uh, MacArthur wanted to go and invade China and drop some nukes or something. And, and Harry Truman said, no, you can't do that. I'm, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> you can really trigger yeah, happy with the nukes. You know, We're just like, yeah, nuke I mean, them. So I, you, I don't even care. Just nuke them. It, I mean, let's take Japan. All right. But that with all of the talk about, you know, complaining about trade from Japan and all that, my God, you know, just a decade before I was born, we were in a fight to the death with them. I mean, it was awful. It was an awful thing. And uh, I would really prefer the relationship we have with Japan here in 2020 to the relationship that we had with them from 1941 to 1945. That, you know, there was not a whole lot of trade going on between the United States and Japan during that period. Yeah, we were trading. Yeah, we were trading flows. <laughs> That's an understatement. I, I, Let me. But it's you know that, that and here's the thing that you know it all sounds like hyperbole, but it is true. Commerce trading relationships are peaceful relationships. We are not at war with China when we're purchasing computers from them uh, or whatnot. And by the way, that one of the reasons that they can run a trade surplus with us is that they're holding dollars because, after all, dollars internationally uh, are what are used in, in the oil markets that uh, they have. They're able to purchase oil and they use dollars. And trust me, if we ever get to arrangement, the dollar is not the international currency for oil, then we'll start seeing our own prices you know, going up. But... Um, but I think that uh, uh, that it's you know for for you know 
whatever happened, you know, and, and yeah, we, we, you know, I know that especially the, 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 while it was the last election and, you know, I, I live in Appalachia. All right. I live near a place like Johnstown. I've been to Johnstown and in these, these cities, places like that, that had a lot of heavy industry and they are dying, you know, from the inside out. I understand that. And, but I do not think that you could, you could put a freaking wall around this country, build a real wall and not let anything in. And I don't think you would be able to save Johnstown uh, or Punxsutawney, except for the fact that they have Punxsutawney built the groundhogs every year. And that's, but uh, Cumberland, you know, or, yeah, exactly. Cumberland, same way. I mean, I don't think you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to, to save it. Um, that uh, there, but there are, you know, that, that there are things that people can do. There are jobs, by the way, going begging that, um, you know, you, you know, and, and so I, that it's, that it's more than just, oh, well, we don't have factories anymore. So therefore, uh, life in, in America is, you know, for some people is a terrible thing. That's true that, that you are going to have, but you've always had shit. Always had things in motion. Pittsburgh, look in, 19, in the Earth recession in nineteen eighty two, lost most of their steel industry, um, and uh, that a lot of Pittsburgh people left. But there's still a lot of people there. But you know something, Pittsburgh is doing pretty well. So, Dr. Anderson, what you just said, I thought was really interesting because um, you had actually written an article at the beginning mm-hmm. of this year, I believe, in January, before all the COVID thing started. Um, And it's called Conservatives are Increasingly Wrong About Market Freedom. And I want to read an excerpt in here, which I think is really great. Um, It says the old socialist countries provide an insightful lesson regarding the freezing in time syndrome. People have visited places like present day Cuba or spent time behind the Iron Curtain in the USSR and the Eastern European satellites were in existence. uh, Many ways that um, things were it felt like you were entering a time warp. And then it said, like those on the left, the anti-capitalist conservatives want to preserve those places that we remember from years ago. What they fail to comprehend is that demanding that the government hold back changes in capitalization uh, and methods by which firms make things, they are also demanding that government restrict changes in everything else. To put it another way, we cannot preserve the 1950s manufacturing economy and the mill village without restricting changes in the quality of medical care, which we receive telecommunications and transportation. I thought that's like the, the failure that we're learning. We want this old thing that we remember without realizing that we can't have that. It's, we can't just recreate yeah. the past. You know, we're just going to make ourselves so poor like we were in the past. Um, like my friends and I, you know, I grew up my first 10 years in Boothwind, Pennsylvania, which is a working class town. Um, and uh, yeah, steel mills, oil refineries, um, my my best friend's father was a machinist at Baldwin Locomotive, and you know we we remember a very happy child. But Gary, my friend, does like to remind me of things like, oh, by the way, we had cesspools back then. You know, you you know the, the place smelled like you know what, and uh, beautiful the, the, place the to gutter, live. You know, there, <laughs> there's some interesting stuff ran down the gutters, but uh, that overall, I mean. Our, the cars we drove, well, I didn't drive, you know, I wasn't old enough to drive, it, but the cars we had, they were junk compared to what we have now. Um, and, you know, Gary likes to remind me, you know, his, his uh, father's tools. Gary said he had his father's miter box. His dad was a contractor as well as a machinist. And he said that he finally donated the box, you know, the saw to the, uh, to the museum because you know, these were museum pieces. But that, in fact, that we have seen higher standards of living uh, across the board. The medical care that we have now compared, oh, my God, compared to what, say, you know, when I was growing up. Oh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's hard even to, you know. And by the way, we say, oh, only the rich get medical care. That's a bunch of crap. You know, you know that you go into, into any any doctor's office, any hospital, it's not full of rich people. Um, and um, you know, the vast majority of people are able to get health care. I'd like to be able to, for us to find ways to, to make sure that more of them can do it. Uh, but it's not 
the, you know, that, that people, you know, you, they get the, this creative thing that we, we live in some sort of dystopia. We don't. Uh, New York City, uh, granted, in the last year, you know, since I was with Mayor de Blasio, and between Mayor de Blasio and COVID, they're trying to knock themselves back into the 1970s. But I remember New York City from the, you know, from the 70s when, um, you know, when you had block after block of abandoned buildings. And, you know, they used to make the, the Death Wish movies there because, you know, they had movies like Escape from New York. Stuff. Um, so we we do we do live better than than we did. All of the predictions that were made by people like Paul Harrell the Club of Rome, uh, even Jimmy Carter and his Global 2000 document from 1980, all of the none of those predictions came true. Um, I was, look, when I was in college, we had the so-called energy crisis, which was created by price controls <laughs> on oil and, and gas. And um, we were told that we're going to be running out within a few years. Well, the known reserves of oil are greater now than they were in the mid-1970s. Uh, and um, I, I think that, that we, we had this picture you know, we were going to overpopulate, we were going to overpopulate, we were going to have mass starvation. It did not happen. We liberalized. People have more, people have better standards of living. Even places like Africa, as hard as life is there. Uh, but, um, you know, I think if, if Americans were to go to Africa, they might find, you know, some pleasant surprises. Uh, you know, part of it because you know, I've got a lot of friends from Africa. And uh, you know, my wife, part of her ancestry was Benin. And so now we have this, you know, and I've got a second cousin who's a professor, takes students to Benin. So now it's like, hey, we want to go with her sometimes. So we call that my, her African ancestry. But, you know, but even even there, you you know, that you will find that, um, and, and Africa tends to have the least liberal of all, you know, in terms of the economy. It's a very it's they it's highly regulated, uh, highly taxed, very corrupt. Uh, but even with all that, they're still able. They've still been able to to increase their standard of living in a lot of places. Now, there's some places where um, it's you just it's it's difficult. It's much more difficult. But we were always told during the 1970s that the reason that Africa was poor is because the United States was uh, was buying goods or resources from Africa, and um, that that you know, um, and I, I wrote a letter to to somebody one time. I said, "Well, all right, let me let me give you Cuba because you guys are telling us two different things of Cuba. Number one, you say Cuba is poor because um, the United States has an embargo against it. Okay, so we don't trade with Cuba." But you say the third world is poor because the United States trades with it. So, if, you know, tell me, which one is it? You know, because it can't be both. And you know, he wrote some letter back, and I, well, I, it depends on the terms of trade. Now, I mean, you know, you know what you're talking about. Then. Okay, I get that. Uh, we, shall not, we shall not continue this conversation. But, um, but the point is that, that trade does have a good effect on, you know, and, and it brings people together. Uh, and, you know, one of the one of the best things that, that's been able to happen with preservation and uh, conservation of, of, you know, African wildlife has been tourism because there's such a, you know, tourism is, is big business. And people say, hey, you know, I'd much rather be a guide and, you know, with, with tourists and you know, work in the tourist business that have to go and scratch out a living, you know, and live in a hut. That uh, so it's you know and that's that's something that so yeah, it trade you know works to their advantage, and also that that it gives some incentives to, to try to save their wildlife and and, and the like. And so uh, there's there's a lot to it. The trade, it, I think, it has positive effects, <clears throat> and. 
uh, and Tucker Carlson is going to convince me otherwise. Uh, I don't think Tucker Carlson could convince anyone of anything. Um, <laughs> but what I'm, I don't think Tucker Carlson could convince anyone. I look at vendetta against him. I don't know what it is. What I'm hearing is trade good, <laughs> bombing people back. Yeah. Trade good. Wow. Bombing people back. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I would like I said, I. I prefer our present relationship with Vietnam to the the relationship with Vietnam that existed when or Cambodia. You know that uh, I mean the, the the stuff that we did there in 19, from about 1969, 1970 on into 1975 that it helped accelerate the you know, horrible tragedy with the Khmer Rouge, right? You know, the so-called, you know, the, the regime of the killing field. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I mean, they still bear responsibility for what they did. I don't, I don't know what they did. But I'm saying is that, that, the, that think about Cambodia now, that I would prefer the present relationship to what, you know, what was going on back in, you know, the 1970s, you know. Just like I would prefer to have, look, I would prefer for Iraq to be what it was before the Gulf War uh, of 1990, before the United States, did, you know, bombed the capital, did a tremendous amount of damage. They never recovered from that. I would prefer that relationship with, you know, with Iraq rather than what we've got now. Absolutely. Um, but Dr. Hess, I really want to thank you for your time. Like you've been super informative and uh, I love the way you explain things. It's so thorough. Um, I see where James gets it from. Cause you guys you know how to pull out the facts. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun tonight. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Like I said, I'd love to be back. We talked about some other things too, because uh, I think we have, we'd have a lot of fun. And uh there's so much to talk about. This this subject and others are just so we large, did. and it's difficult to talk about it all in one sitting. We gave it a shot, though. So thank you. Thank you, guys. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Join us next week when we talk about the drug war. And um, right. Sarah Brooks, we're going to be keeping Bye. up the memes, and we will see you guys soon.